Thanks so much for being here. My name is Liz McGill. I'm the Dean of the Stanford Law School. I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this incredible event tonight. Let me first ask you, if you don't mind, if there are seats in the middle, if you wouldn't mind moving it a bit. We do, I think we will have more folks come. We had a sort of sold out show this evening, uh, as it were, so I think some people will come in. So if you can arrange some seats on the aisle, that would be great. I want to welcome you to this advanced screening of the movie Marshall, which is going to have open wide nation release on October 13th. Because uh, the director of this movie, Reggie Hadlin, is with us tonight, I'm going to give an introduction to him in a moment. Yes. But it needs to go somewhere. We're actually going to have a discussion of the film, uh, the panel discussion of the film, before we show the film. Uh, if you have questions after seeing the film, the other panelists, uh, Pro Professor Elam and Professor Rohde will stay after and will answer your questions. So thanks for your patience. Justice Thurgood Marshall is a looming historical presence for, I think, everyone in this room, certainly for all of us in the legal profession. Uh, those of us who follow his career in law uh, know much about him. His landmark advocacy in the desegregation case of Brown versus Board of Education, uh, where he successfully argued one of the most important cases of the 20th century that the Supreme Court decided. We're also familiar, those of us in law, with his groundbreaking role as the first black Supreme Court justice, uh, the first African-American Solicitor General of the United States. In both cases, he continued to champion for the full expression of the civil rights of all people to ach achieve the promise of equality under the law. In his concurrence in Furman versus Georgia, which suspended the death penalty in the United States, he wrote, at a time in our history when the streets of the nation's cities inspire fear and despair rather than pride and hope, it is difficult to maintain objectivity and concern for our fellow citizens. But the measure of a country's greatness is in its ability to retain compassion in a time of crisis. This wonderful film, Marshall, extends our understanding of Justice Marshall's legacy by focusing on his early career as an NAACP lawyer. He traveled to Connecticut to defend a young African-American man accused of sexual assault and attempted murder by his wealthy white employer. As Professor Rohde has written, from the start of his career, Marshall's extraordinary courage and determination helped change the landscape of American race relations. We're thrilled tonight to welcome the film's director, Reginald Hudlin, to Stanford for a discussion of the making of the film. These past few years have made it clear how much engagement with issues of race and the legacy of this uh, nation's original sin, slavery, remains important and it's incredibly uh, exciting to be here with you tonight to see this film. Let me introduce the panelists who are gonna have a brief conversation with you about the movie. Uh, Professor Hale Harry Elam is with us. He will uh, both discuss and moderate the conversation. Uh, Professor Elam is the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education. The Olive H. Palmer Professor in the Humanities, the Robert and Ruth Halpern University Fellow for Undergraduate Education, and he has several other uh, incredibly impressive titles. Mm -hmm. He is the author and editor of seven books. In addition, he has directed professionally for over 20 years. Uh, most notably, he directed Todd, The Boy Todd by Telvin Wilkes for the Oakland Ensemble Company. At Stanford, he's been awarded five different teaching awards. I can say personally that I've had enormous, uh, the enormous privilege of being able to work with Professor Elam in my time at Stanford. He is always wise, uh, he is always thoughtful, uh, he is uh, visionary, and it's a true privilege to have him talk to us tonight. Professor Deborah Rohde of the Law School uh, will also be on the panel. Uh, Professor Rohde is uh, a longtime member of the law school faculty, a prolific scholar who's written on gender and the law, legal, the legal profession, leadership in the law, civil rights and the law. She was, uh, she's currently the director of the Center on the Legal Profession. Uh, among her many accolades in her career, one I think that is most cherished by her is the fact that she had the privilege of clerking for Justice Marshall at, when he was on the Supreme Court. Last but hardly least uh, is, I think, the, the second star of the show to the movie itself, the director <laughs> of the movie, Marshall, Reginald Hudland. Reginald Hudland is a pioneer of the modern black film movement. He's directed some of the most influential films and television series of his generation. His most recent efforts include producing the 30th anniversary of Showtime at the Apollo for Fox. 
In February 2016, Reggie Hudlin was one of the producers of the American Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences 88th Annual Academy Awards, for which he subsequently received an Emmy nomination in the category of Outstanding Special Class Program. Also for Ampus, he produced the sixth annual Governor's Awards and the Black Movie Soundtrack, the recurring live cinematic concert experience at the Hollywood Bowl. Additional, additionally, uh, he's been the executive producer of the NAACP Image Awards for the past five years, from 2012 to 2017. In 2012, he was nominated for Best Academy Award, Best Picture Academy Award, as one of the producers of Quentin Tarantino's Academy Award and Golden Globe winning movie, Django Unchained one of the top grossing Westerns of all time. In his more than 30 year career, Reggie Hudlin has written, directed, and or produced numerous popular feature films, including House Party, Boomerang, and Bebby's Kids. He was an executive producer and writer of the animated TV series Black Panther, and an executive producer of The Boondocks. Along with the original founding members, Hudlin received the beloved comic book, revived the beloved comic book company, Milestone Media. As Black Entertainment Television's first president of entertainment in 2005 to 2009, he shepherded some of the network's biggest hits, including Sunday Best, BET Honors, and BET Hip Hop Awards. He also bit, uh, built BET's profitable home entertainment division and revamped the network news division, which went on to win more than a dozen awards during that period. In other words, we have kind of a rock star in our midst tonight, <laughs> just to make it short and sweet. Uh, let me last give you one warning, which is the unusual warning to please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> I will tell you that it is unusual because this is a pre-screening of the film. And if you have your cell phone on and it makes any noises, there may be a concern that you are taking a movie of the movie. And the security may come out and take you away. So please, <laughs> even more than usual, please turn off your cell phones. Last, this effort tonight has been co-sponsored by many organizations on campus, including the Center for the Legal Profession at the Law School, Harry Elam in the Office of Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, the Office of the Undergraduate Admissions and Financial Aid, the Office of the Vice Provost for Student Affairs, the Black Community Services Center, the Center for Commemorative Studies and Race and Ethnicity, the McCoy Family Center on Ethics and Society, the Levin Center for Public Service, the Black Law Students Association, the American Constitution Society. In other words, this is a campus-wide excitement uh, about this movie and this director being with us tonight. Thank you for being with us. Welcome. Thank you, Liz, for those words and introduction. And uh, welcome, everybody. Oh, we can do better than that. Welcome. I know you all are excited to see this film. Um, and I want to start by asking the director, what was its genesis? How did it come about? Why this movie and why this story of Thurgood Marshall? Um, hi, everybody. Mm. How you doing? How your mama doing? <laughs> um, first of all, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. Um, Sterling K. Brown, who's in the film, you know, the guy with the two Emmys. Stanford man. I was, I was with him last night. He was like, are you going up to Stanford Law School? I said, yes. He said, pleased to tell you hello. Tell you all hello. Uh, he was surprised when we were working together that uh, we're both from St. Louis. I'm from East St. Louis. He's from St. Louis. And I would tease him about being from St. Louis. And he said, oh, I can't believe you're teasing me about that. I thought you would tease me about me going to Stanford and uh, you went to Harvard. I said, Stanford is a wonderful school. I would love to have my kids go to Stanford, but St. Louis is inexcusable. <laughs> so, but he's, as I hope you guys know, an enormously gifted actor, uh, a brilliant person, but most of all, a fantastic human being. So. You should be very proud of Mr. Sterling K. Brown. Um, and you'll see his latest and, and truly amazing work in this film. But his entire body of work uh, speaks to who he is as an artist. To your question, I've always been a giant Thurgood Marshall fan. I always felt that he was 
underrated both as one of the greatest American heroes and certainly in the pantheon of black superheroes, you know. I mean, we all kind of have our own personal Mount, Rush, Mount Rushmore's. At least I do. I don't know if other people think like that. But I keep going, boy, if I had my own, I would have Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Thurgood. Um, because Thurgood is the guy who took the promise of the American Constitution, all men are created equal, one man, one vote, all these great ideas that were denied from the very start. You know, the, that symbol of the crack in the Liberty Bell could not be more apt for the American experiment. And he took those promises and said, we're gonna make these things real. And he dragged the Constitution into reality uh, more than anyone else. And for that and much, much more, every single American owes him a tremendous debt of gratitude. So. <laughs> if this film in some way gives him the proper shine on his legacy, then we did a good thing. Someone was asking me earlier about the power of cinema. You know, the first movie shown in the White House was during the Woodrow Wilson administration. Unfortunately, the movie was Birth of a Nation, yeah. sort of the template for racist, racism in cinema. And Woodrow Wilson had a very powerful line when he asked about the movie. He said, it was history written in lightning. The lightning part was true. The history part was not. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so our goal is always, can we add some correctives using the same electrical, electric power of cinema, but to tell truth instead of you know, lies and mythology. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, I read you called, the, I called Thurgood a black superhero. You clerked for him, as Liz let us know earlier. What, what uh, are your memories of that experience, or what particularly resonates for you from that experience? Well, you know, Marshall was born in 1908. It was a world of rampant racism. 89 blacks were lynched in the year of his birth. And as he used to tell us, um, he grew up in a segregated city where blacks could not only attend the same schools, but even drink from the same water fountains as whites. And challenging this injustice was really his life's work. And the film captures the extraordinary courage and commitment that was required when he was head of the NAACP, he spent a quarter century crisscrossing the country trying cases. He was on the road half of the year uh, establishing a network of civil rights lawyers and arguing in the most hostile segregated communities where there were no hotels and restaurants that would serve blacks, where lynch mobs often operated with immunity, where white judges and law enforcement officials were part of the problem, not the solution. And his work in those cases challenging discrimination in schools, housing, voting, public transportation, police conduct, um, helped really change the landscape of American race relations. And at his memorial service in the early 1990s, um, Chief Justice Rehnquist noted that inscribed above the Supreme Court's um, entrance were the words equal justice under law and as, Marsh, and as Rehnquist said, surely no one individual did more to make that a reality than Thurgood Marshall. And it shined through in every piece of work he did as a Supreme Court justice as well as a litigator. Thank you. Now, in, in, in terms of uh, the film and thinking about him and given the picture that Deborah just painted, um, the common thing thought would be you would do Brown versus Board, but that's not what this is. This movie is about this case. Why this case, and what do you try to do with this story of Thurgood Marshall? Right. Uh, we did this one because you don't know it. <laughs> so we actually have a mystery because you don't know how it turns out. You don't know if he's innocent or guilty. You don't know if the jury cares if he's innocent or guilty. Uh, so. That was a big part of the appeal because we wanted, it's a movie. And you, we did Brown versus the Board of Education. You go, ah, I learned that in fifth grade. I, I got it. Uh, but you don't got this. Um, and I also loved it because it was set in the North. Uh, most films about struggles in civil rights are set in the South. And 
presumed we've all seen enough uh, tobacco chewing sheriffs in our lives that we don't <laughs> need to do that again. Um, Northern racism has that veneer of civility about it that makes, makes it much more relatable, much more current, much like the struggles that some of us have today. So I thought it would be um, more resonant with contemporary audiences. Thank you. And, and, and one of the things that potentially makes it res resonant is that, uh, what do you call it? You call it a whodunit, a thriller? Yeah, I mean, it's a legal thriller, right? Because you, you want to know who did it and what happened. Um, so it, it's got that element. It's, it's also a little bit of a Western, right? Um, I know this generation may not know Westerns that well, but you know, Shane, and if you haven't seen Shane, that's a thing to see. Just Django they've yeah. seen. Django. <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking. <laughs> But the idea is, I mean, the classic Western archetype is the lawman comes to town. He dispenses justice, and then he moves on to the next town. There's no better description than Marshall than that. Uh, you know, you know, as you just described, you know, he's, you know, sacrificed his family, his, his life for this mission. And that sacrifice was a choice. You know, here he is, you know, he's living in Harlem, you know, on Sugar Hill in the midst of the Harlem Renaissance, there's, why would you want to leave? You're hanging out with your college friends, uh, Cab Calloway and, and Langston Hughes, you know, why do you leave that, get on a train, and, you know, go to places that will lynch you after sundown? You know, that was his extraordinary sense of mission. That's incredible. Deborah, speaking of a sense of mission, you came to work for him. Uh, in Clerk from how what was the the interview process? What was that that story like coming to work for this man? Well, I, I went to law school partly because I had read about and been inspired by uh, Marshall and his work in the civil rights um, campaign, and, and the prospect that I might actually have a chance to clerk for him was just unimaginable. Um, so I I prepared. For for this very brief interview, um, just months. I read every decision he'd written in the last 10 years, every dissent, you know. And what I didn't realize at the time was that all of that was kind of irrelevant. Um, Marshall had clerkship applications screened by former clerks and professors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you got to the interview stage, you were qualified. The interview was about something else. So um, I came in and he sort of glanced at my resume and looked at me and he said, I see you got a Phi Beta Kappa key while you were an undergraduate at Yale. What do women do with Phi Beta Kappa keys? <laughs> you know, all of my preparation had not um, <laughs> <laughs> enabled me to answer that question. So, you know, I fell back on the truth and I, I said, well, I, I gave it to my mother and she put it on her charm bracelet. And he, he chuckled, and that was the interview. Um, I, I, I ran to the ladies' room sobbing, you know, to a constant close, and to somehow blown it in such an inexplicable way. Um, but before I managed to leave the, the building, um, I, I got the offer to be his clerk. And one of the things I learned in clerking for him was mm -hmm. uh, his extraordinary sense of humor that came out in his relations with, with everyone. And it comes through so clearly in the movie. It was you know with the people who delivered the mail, the Chief Justice, who he called. Um, he'd say, how are things doing, Chiefy baby? Um, <laughs> and and you know, he would tell these wonderful humorous stories um, that um, always had a point, um, just a couple. Uh, one was, uh, he'd get mistaken sometimes by tourists who would get lost in the building and they'd see him and think he was the elevator person or the messenger. Mm -hmm. He would come back just delighted to tell us those stories. And he liked telling them to people, especially people of privilege, just to remind them uh, of, of what it was like. And he, he told, uh, one of my favorite stories was that when he was appointed to the Second Circuit, uh, they took a picture to reflect the new composition of the court, and uh, he was uh, uh, he arrived in the Chief Justice's office, and people didn't um, know who he was, especially the Chief Justice's secretary, 
at the time. And when he walked in, the, everyone was sort of um, stumbling around in the dark. The, uh, in the old days, the photographer had set up and blown the fuse, so the lights were off. And the Chief Justice Secretary looked at him with great relief and said, oh, the electrician has arrived. <laughs> and Marsha, without losing a beat, looked back at her and said, ma'am, if you think I could get into that union, you are very much mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Reggie, following that, it, it, the humor, you're known for humor in the films, many of the films you've done, but mm -hmm. certainly that was part of the character that you had in, in shaping Marshall. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, we, he was legendary for a sense of humor. Those stories are so spectacular. Oh my God. Um, so I, I, you know, and it's it's also a weapon, right? He's going into these towns. They've never seen a black lawyer before, um, and they would hang him after sundown. So how many ways can he take them completely off balance? So humor was one of his tools in his toolkit. Um, and it also makes for um, uh, a movie that's more entertaining because we all come in with the baggage of our image of Thurgood, older, in the robes, in the cloistered world of the Supreme Court. So to see him young with some swag and a sense of humor can surprise you as well. So beyond that sense of humor, you mentioned the, our image of him. Um, uh, Deborah, one of the things that uh, Elizabeth Kagan, who all, Justice, uh, who also clerked for him, said she called him the greatest lawyer of the 20th century. Would you agree with that, and why and what made him so? You know, um, we're so fond of lists, you know, greatest this, top of that. Um, and so without necessarily um, going there, I will just say that, um, you know, of all the lawyers, and I've written several books now about lawyers as leaders that, um, that I've studied, he stands out, um, both because of his great sense of justice and his personal sacrifice, um, his capacity to understand how to move the country and the court in the directions that it needed to move, and just his enormous humanity and the way that he dealt with everyone. Um, you know, I, I was telling the reporter from the Stanford Daily earlier on that you know, when, when we were clerking for him, it was kind of a high pressure uh, uh, clerkship because you were writing a lot, um, it was important, and you know, we were young kids right out of law school. Uh, and we didn't always handle it so well. And when he would see that happening, he would always make a point of stopping by and saying, you know, no one's on death row. And what was so um, insightful about that is, of course, he spent much of his life representing people who were on death row, including the one in this movie. And it gave him a sense of perspective on what was and wasn't important. And he really sacrificed um, so much of his life uh, to, um, uh, to really making the country's rhetorical promises about equal justice under law something closer to a reality. Thank you. Let's go a little bit in, into the movie uh, without obviously giving it away, but whetting your appetites even more. Um, Deborah, and, and, and think what resonates in terms of the movie film, you've seen it in terms of the character. What resonates for you in terms of the man you knew or the justice you knew? Well, I think one thing, and, and this builds on something Reggie said earlier, um, you know, uh, Marshall was the only justice who had not come from a privileged background. And he understood all the both petty indignities and massive injustices that constituted um, race relations. And, and he brought that um, to his work. Uh, I'll just give one other example from the year that I clerked with him. Um, it was in the late 1970s, and that year was the bicentennial of the American Constitution. And uh, the Chief Justice had this notion that it would be nice to celebrate this with a pageant uh, that would reenact the signing of the American Constitution with all the Supreme Court justices present. And Marshall said, well, that would be fine as long as it would portray him accurately in livery and knee breeches holding the tray. 
Um, the enactment, needless to say, didn't happen, <laughs> but uh, Marshall used the occasion to remind the nation of the enormous injustice that was present at the very beginning of the Constitution. You know, when, when the founders said, we the people, they weren't talking about the people, and the Constitution enfranchised only white landowners. And Marshall was insistent that those celebrations of the Constitution be so um, accurate in portraying its reality. And of course, no one has, did more in the course of his life to try to change that reality um, than Marshall himself. And you, you get that sense um, from the movie of what the stakes were for him in this struggle, um, both you know personally and also uh, professionally. So given that what she just talked about, the, the stakes, the personal and the professional, you cast an ad, a, actor, uh, Chad, Chadwick Boseman, as uh, Thurgood Marshall. And you may know Chadwick Boseman because he's been in two biopics. He played James Brown, and he also played uh, just no, Jackie Robinson, thank you. My mind is a terrible thing to waste here. <laughs> um, so why him, and what does he bring to this, and what did you try to do in terms of casting him and using him in this? I mean, when you look at Chadwick's body of work, uh, he is a very deeply committed actor who transforms himself for the role. When you look at him as Jackie Robinson and James Brown, um, those are two biopics, but you couldn't find two vastly different men. And I knew he would be up for the, and then add T'Challa the Black Panther to that oh, that's right. list, uh, that he would be more than up to the challenge of becoming Thurgood Marshall. And uh, he's a Howard University graduate uh, as well, so he was instantly familiar with uh, both his legacy and, and his importance. Um, and, and did the work, because Chadwick is an intellectual as well as an artist. So he dove very deeply into the character, transformed himself, and was up for the challenge, the unique challenges of the role. Um, also, he's just a great guy. Um, mm. So, you know, when we first talked about it, he, his first concern was doing another biopic, um, which he did not want to do, but he really liked this script and we really liked each other and we were looking for a chance to work together. Um, he was concerned that he didn't look, look, not look like Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and we talked about that and I said, well, this is not a cradle to grave biopic. And in this case, there's nothing that would change because regarding his skin tone. So um, that plus the enthusiastic uh, letter that he got from the Marshall family who mm -hmm. asked him to play the role. Wow. And, and, and who told us that if his father knew that the best qualified person would not get the role because he was too dark, he would have been furious. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, one of the things in, in terms of the film that we see, and another label that uh, been used with is, is the buddy film. Mm -hmm. the, the relationship, and you talked about color. Well, you've, he had to have a, a white lawyer with him, mm -hmm. and so how did you feel about that relationship, uh, the, the white lawyer Friedman and, uh, mm -hmm. and that with Thurgood and what? Well, I mean, it, it comes down to sort of, you know, the various themes of what the movie's about, and ultimately this is a movie about allies, and it's particularly, I mean, obviously the, um, the black-Jewish partnership in politics and entertainment in a number of fields. Um, it's an, an important part of the American legacy, right? Um, I mean, you got, you know, Cheney, Ch you know, Sharon and Goodwin all buried together, these young boys who sacrificed their lives for all of us. So, I mean, that is a bond that's paid for in blood. Um, and yes, there's friction and there's tension that, uh, that happens over time in any relationship, in any marriage, in any partnership. Um, but it's important to remember that teamwork, particularly in times like this, because freedom is not free. And every generation gets tested. And if there's, I think it's pretty safe to say this is our turn. You know, our country's in a crisis. Some people feel democracy's in danger. And no in one individual, no one group,
can face it alone. But it doesn't matter where we come from, doesn't matter if we agree on everything, if we have a commitment to the truth, particularly in a time when truth as a concept is under attack, if we bond together on the most crucial parts of humanity, of democracy, of the American experiment, we can beat them before the same way you know, we did, right? We, we, beat it, we won before we can win again. So you know, when you're feeling depressed or despair in the midst of the 24-hour news cycle, we got this. <laughs> well, we just have to believe in ourselves. <laughs> So your, your answer to that sort of anticipated my, my last question. And my last question, De Deborah, starting with you. Um, why this film, what now, what do you think resonates uh, about this film within our world today? And, and Reggie, I'll let you take the same question after her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, this, this is a moment when we need heroes. And Thurgood Marshall was a hero. Um, after his death, an obituary in the Legal Times noted that not all great men are good men. Marshall was both. Marshall himself was a lot more modest when uh, reporters asked him how he wanted to be remembered. He responded and he told his clerks the same thing. He wanted to be known as someone who did what he could with what he had. And this film, I think, just reminds us of how much that was that he had and gives us such a good model of the kind of leader that we so sorely need today. Thank you. Mm. Um, I, I, it's, when we made the film, it was the sort of last year of the Obama administration. The election was starting to heat up. Trump was getting some traction as a possible Republican nominee. Uh, we were watching Brexit very closely. Dan Stevens, one of our actors, is English. He was following the election. We kept going, that'll never happen. That'd be crazy. Um, so this movie is emerging in a very different world than what it was made in. I mean, even though we were very concerned with Ferguson and there were a lot of issues at the time, um, you know, it's not the DEF CON 5 that, you know, we feel today. And the times, I think, kind of shape how people see the film. And there's a greater urgency now when people see it. And I'm really grateful that people see the movie as an antidote, right, uh, to what's happening now. I mean, you guys will look at it and you'll, you'll tell me what you think. Uh, fortunately, I, I'm going to take off, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know. What yeah, let me you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm all on the social media. What, what do young people do? Just hit me on all that stuff. Say yay or nay. Um, and I, I think that's what's important. I, I think, you know, um, you know, we all have you know, uh, responsibilities as citizens to do something, to try to do the right thing. And um, and we all choose our battlefield, we all choose our weapons. Um, his gun was the law, so many of you are packing your six shooters now and learning how to shoot straight, um, so that's wonderful. But even if you're not a lawyer, does, does it mean you can't fight the fight in, in any number of arenas? I mean, this is my choice of weapons. Um, you know, you choose yours. Thank you. So, and, oh, wait, one last thing. Okay. I just, I want to thank this woman. Um, when we made the film, we had to, I didn't know the man, so I guessed, right? We all did all our research, and we kind of came up with a matrix of who he was. But I didn't have confirmation from someone who actually knew the man until you saw the film. And your reaction immediately after literally meant the world to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I mean, I mean, I held it together. I didn't lose it, but I was very close. <laughs> well, so. I was kind of close myself um, on that occasion. And you know, I so enormously appreciate all you've done to, to bring this story to, to life. So thank you.
well, thank you, because it, it, it meant everything to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we give them both a big hand? Thank you, thank you, thank you to both of you.